Dios. Key. Thank you, Brian, for the beautiful music you shared with us this morning. We appreciate the special music and the gift of, of music you're sharing with us. Thank you also to the Bishop's Cabinet and uh, the wonderful service that they prepared for us online so that the leadership of our church could enjoy a Sunday off. I know maybe it wasn't quite an appropriate Advent celebration, but uh, we did have a lot to be thankful for, and so having two Thanksgiving-themed services was okay. But be prepared, Avid is upon us already and we are in the middle of it today. So let's just pause for a moment and just have a short prayer as we kind of bring ourselves together just to center on this time of celebration. Dear Lord, our thankful God, I am so appreciative that you've given us a chance just to gather together in this venue. We wish it were in person, but Lord, at least you've given us this much. We, at this time, right now, 
worshiping together, can celebrate, praise, and worship your holy name. Help us just to set aside the cares of the world for a few moments and just to listen for your still voice in the back of our heads, showing us a path to the manger. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, again, welcome. I'm glad you chose to worship with us today. Um, unfortunately, we're still virtual mode here until at least January 10th when the bishop reevaluates us and gives us guidance again. But wherever you might be and wherever you might be watching this, I pray that you're safe and taking care of watching out for all those others that you interact with to show the love of Christ in a safe way. At this point, I'd like to welcome Tyler DeHaan, our finance chairman. He has an update for finances he'd like to share with you. Tyler? Hello, Waukee United Methodist Church. This is Tyler DeHaan. I am your finance chair here through the end of 2020. Beginning in 2021, Rick Kaiser will be taking over for me. But I wanted to give you just a quick update on where we are at here going into December. First and foremost, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your generous giving throughout 2020. I know it's been a very difficult year for a lot of us, uh, both financially, spiritually, but I want to say thank you so much for all of your generous giving to the Waukee United Methodist Church throughout 2020. As we enter into the final month of 2020, uh, it's important to understand that there are a couple of ways that you can kind of enhance your gifts to the Waukee United Methodist Church. The first is a lot of employers have uh, additional matching programs that you can tap into. So if you work for an employer that's looking at matching for any gifts given to 501c3 charities, feel free to uh, tap into those programs. Also, be a reminder is that for if you were doing qualified charitable distributions out of your IRAs, that is still something that you can do for 2020. And last but not least, if you have any highly appreciated stock, I know it's kind of amazing, we've had quite the run up in the stock market. If you have highly appreciated stock, it's another way to give to a 501c3 charity that can help minimize your taxable liabilities for 2020. As of today, uh, we are have a deficit in the church of around $38,000. However, I want to I want to tell you that that has been buffered by the PPP loans that we got back in March. We got about $42,000 in PPP loans in March to buffer that $38,000 deficit. The one thing that a lot of people have asked me is, is that a loan or did we get that as a grant? We actually got that as a grant. So we are not going to be required to pay back that $42,000. So as of today, we have a church deficit of about $38,000. There is the PPP loans that is going to offset that. But for us to finish in the black for 2020, we are going to probably need to generate around $50,000 here for the month of December. I know that may seem like a pretty big number, but in my last three years here as your finance chair, every year we've gotten into December, we have had to get at least that amount, if not more, to balance the budget. And every single year, we have been able to get that number. So that's kind of the number we have to shoot for to get into the black. And in closing, I want to say this. I want to thank you so much for all of your generous giving, your prayers, and your support of this church. We, we are truly blessed to have your support here in this community and show God's light and love here in the community of Waukee when it's needed the most. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and have a great Christmas. Thank you very much, Tyler. I've appreciated getting to know Tyler better over the past couple of years as he served as a finance chair. And unfortunately, he rolls off of that uh, duty coming here in the beginning of 2021. I've just uh, learned to respect Tyler in a lot of ways. He runs a very tight agenda, I will admit, because he can get a meeting done in one hour when I don't see that it's going to make it. But also, he continuously seeks to ask for feedback and to improve the way that he does things. So I think that's a great role model for all of the leaders in our church and all the people in our church in general, because we should always be looking for ways that we can be better. But thank you again, Tyler. I greatly appreciate your service. 
I do have a moment here, so Michaela, you better take your headphones off, and uh, Jamie, if you're watching this, fast forward like 30 seconds here. One of the things that we have traditions we have was collecting uh, uh, a little bag or an envelope for a staff Christmas gift, and so we can't, of course, do that this year in the same way that we've done it before, but I would ask if you would like to support a gift for our staff leadership, uh, please uh, make a donation through Realm, and, and there should be a setting there that you can mark it for a staff gift or send a check to the church and just mark staff gift in the memo line. We'd appreciate that. We'd love to send you know, the pastor and all the office staff here a wonderful holiday message that we appreciate their leadership and this time. So please uh, mark that on your to-do list if you wouldn't mind over the next couple of weeks. Okay, Michaela, you can put your headphones back on and Jamie, you can come back now if you were went away, so. <laughs> but speaking of gifts too, um, we've got a picture here to show you. There are many people that are working hard to try and figure out how we can create some special music during this time for our holidays. And whether it comes in our regular celebrations or a, a wonderful Christmas Eve celebration that we're planning, uh, you can see here the praise team has figured out how to gather and rehearse in a, in a socially isolated way using the entire sanctuary here as our, our uh, sound booth. So I appreciate everybody who is coming together at this time just to offer their special gifts of music. Well, speaking of Advent here, I think we have an Advent wreath that we should light. This is our Sunday of peace, so let's call the foals forward here to light our Advent wreath. Isaiah 10, verses 1 and 2, 6 through 8. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The suckling child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope, remembering the hope which comes in Christ. Today, we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. God has a peaceful dream for the world, and we dream it too. We dream of a peaceful world full of wolves and leopards and lions, eating and sleeping and dancing with lambs, kids, and calves. We dream of a peaceful world where nations come together, where war is a memory and we eat at one table. We light this candle in peace. On this day, we remember the Lord of all who brings peace, surpassing all understanding. Thank you very much, Travis, Carrie, family. I appreciate you participating in our celebration today. Well, Carla, we have a time for a message from you. I'm waiting. Good morning, boys and girls. Oh, I love this time of the year. It's so much fun to decorate and start getting ready for Jesus' birth. You know, it reminds me of the time that we spend waiting. Have you ever had to wait and you thought, I can't contain myself. I, wa I want to, I, I got to have to have it happen right now. Like maybe not waiting for the bus or maybe waiting for your mom to get done off the phone so you can talk to her. Those kinds of things we have to learn how to be patient, very patient. But sometimes, boys and girls, it's hard to wait. And I think that Christmas is especially hard, and especially that we're starting to decorate earlier and earlier. I think it's hard for kids and for adults. Well, I brought something today that used to help my kids kind of help with that being impatient for Christmas to happen, that waiting time for us to have that joyful day, the Christmas day. And it's just a, um, just a string of paper, and every day closer to Christmas, you take off a link of it. Now, we're not going to do that today. I just wanted to show you that this is one way. So one day closer, you take it off. And sometimes that helps us with our waiting. Now, a lot of parents, I know my daughter does, she buys an advent calendar. And that they get a piece of chocolate or something or a new toy or something in this advent calendar. 
And that sometimes helps with that waiting. But I want to talk about some people that had to wait a long time. Way in the Old Testament, sometimes things were rough for some of the early believers in God. And they sometimes had to go with the rules of a king or some kind of a leader that weren't very good, that just wasn't good. And they, in the Bible, it tells us that they were promised a savior. They were promised a king that was going to come. And boys and girls, let me tell you, that was a long wait. It's, it was a long, long wait. It was more than every year that we wait for Christmas or every year that we wait for our new birthday coming. It was a long wait. When the Savior finally came, they were so happy. And you know, during that time of waiting, they were hoping that the Savior was exactly what they were told in the scriptures. He would come and save us save them and be the king that we were told was coming. Well, this Christmas season, boys and girls, I want you to remember as you're waiting patiently, and however you wait, whether you use one of these or you use the Advent calendar, that you need to wait patiently because the king is coming and soon we will be celebrating his birthday, a joyous time. And during that time of waiting, remember one word, the word hope. Those people way back in the Bible had hope. They believed in hope that the Savior was coming. We also need to have hope that the Savior is coming and be with us on this Christmas day. Boys and girls, let's have a prayer. Dear Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Help us as we wait patiently, sometimes for things to happen, that we know we are in hope that it's gonna be a joyous occasion. Give us hope, give us peace as we wait for your son. Amen. Boys and girls, have a great Sunday. Thank you so much, Carla. All right, I'll remember to wait patiently, but it's kind of hard sometimes, isn't it? At this point, we have special music with Jen and Kara, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Thank you again for, for sharing your gift of music, whether it's virtual or in real life. Hope that everybody remembers the tune because the words of that song are so much 
are so important, especially this time of year. We come to a time of our celebration where we have a chance for you just to have a, a conversation with the Lord. And we've talked a lot about peace today. We've talked a lot about coming to the manger. We're coming to Advent, having patience to wait for Christmas to arrive. There's a lot of things that we could pray for, but just the Lord's calling us to prepare the way for him. And I think as we at our house this Thanksgiving just unpacked all of our Christmas stuff and all of the memories and things that come with that, there's a lot of emotional baggage I think that we need to unpack. So let's just have a moment to pray with God and I'll bring us together after our silent prayer. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, what a year this has been. So much has happened, so much is different that we don't know how to even approach Advent this year. But one thing is for sure, if we are to make way for the Lord, to make way for you, it's time for us to do a little house cleaning. Many of us have been packing away burdens and stresses that we don't know how to deal with work struggles, family struggles, depression and dependency struggles. It's time to drag those things out into the open, unpack them and confront them so that we can move beyond them just to fully enjoy the anticipation and hope that comes with celebrating the birth of our Savior. Lord, I ask just help us repair damaged relationships through forgiveness. Help us restore trust with one another where it's been lost. Help us to have confidence in the future that it holds promise and hope for healing. Help us to recommit ourselves to your work in our daily lives by letting go of all of our baggage weighing us down. But Lord, in all of this, I just have to ask, are we making a way for you or are you making a way for us? Our church has some serious ministry decisions to make in the coming weeks. And in all honesty, it's so hard for us just to let go of something, especially if we think that letting go means that it's a failure. But Lord, in reality, maybe you're helping us move on to something even better, to take one ministry that's doing so-so, to make way for a beautiful new ministry that could be successful, something that could even be more fruitful, that could fill an even greater need for our community, reaching those that really need the love of Christ or at least an introduction to what it means to be a follower of Christ. Lord, these decisions are heavy and they have an impact, but as they're made and the fog slowly lifts its way to reveal a path forward, I just ask that you help us be sensitive to the impact these decisions may have. And above all, remind us just to show your grace and your reconciling love in all the things we do, knowing that we don't even have a mere glimpse of what your plan is for us in this world, and we need to place our trust in you. So as we get out our dust busters and we do a little house cleaning to prepare for Emmanuel, God with us, remind us you are always with us from the manger to the cross. Let us share the Lord's Prayer together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for sharing our prayer time today. And from whatever you take away from that, just remember that the Lord loves you and he's waiting for you at the manger and every day of your life. We come to the time for our scripture reading and thanks to that trick, that pickleball trick that Bob pulled on us a couple weeks ago, my red ball is still missing in action. So I've got a substitute here 
I got a good ball here. I'm hoping that I can wing this one quite a ways because it's got to get way past Indiana to the East Coast. Jeez, Dad. All you had to do was ask. Tennis ball wasn't needed. All right. The scripture reading for this week is from Mark chapter 1, 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send you my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel hairs with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I can't wait to see my family in two weeks. Hope you guys are doing well, but the one I miss the most is Ollie. I can't wait to see you, buddy. <laughs> what did you do to my ball? <laughs> Ollie. <laughs> Thank you so much, Caitlin. I, I'm so glad you got to share on our celebration today. We do miss you, but we're excited to see you at Christmas and we will try to be patient because it is coming. So with that, we've had celebration, we've had music, we've had scripture, we've had the advent lighting of our wreath. Pastor Jamie, will you help lead us on into understanding what all of this means? Well, thank you, uh, Dennis and Caitlin for uh, bringing us the gospel lesson for this morning. <clears throat> from Mark chapter 1, all the way from New Hampshire. Uh, I have to tell you, it's uh, good to see you and good to hear from you. And I just have to remark again on how uh, strong those sewn arms are. I mean, that's, that's got to be over a thousand miles out there and back. Anyway, um, we thank you for that. Friends, because of the Bishop's Cabinet Worship Service that we were all blessed to enjoy last Sunday, which was perhaps more of a November, kind of fall, autumn theme, Thanksgiving theme service, uh, we didn't get a chance last Sunday, which was the first Sunday in Advent, to, to hear and consider some of the more traditional lectionary scriptures for the first Sunday in Advent. Um, and I think in light of this, this, this terribly tumultuous year that has produced so much anxiety and fear in so many lives, before we consider Mark chapter 1, our gospel lesson for the second Sunday in Advent, let's hear last week's gospel for the first Sunday in Advent. Mark chapter 13, also known as the little apocalypse. Now Jesus is sharing with his disciples <clears throat> some clues about his return, all of them rather dire. Uh, I won't read the whole scripture, but just kind of summarize it. Jesus says there's going to be wars, famines, earthquakes. He says false leaders are going to arise and lead people astray, even people of faith. Personal beliefs are going to separate families from each other and cause strife and hostility, even persecution towards others. There's going to be suffering that has not been seen since the beginning of creation until now, he says. And then he finishes by saying, here comes the darkness. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers in heaven will be shaken. Kind of reminds you of District Superintendent Doug Q's uh, sermon last Sunday, doesn't it? With a little red hand and the sky is falling. <clears throat> yeah, well, Jesus finishes by saying, but about that day and that hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It'll be like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with their own work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, you keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come whether in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to everyone, keep awake, watch. So I did. <clears throat> yeah, I kept awake and I watched uh, 
several hours, uh, even through the middle of the afternoon, of an Advent webinar convened and hosted by the uh, Reverend Adam Hamilton, you know, the senior pastor of our United Methodist Church uh, of the Resurrection down in Kansas City. Uh, Hamilton had assembled a number of brilliant theological and very creative worship minds from across the country and facilitated a number of topical discussions about this Advent season. One of the topics uh, that I found really interesting was by titled Finding Hope in This Year of Loss and Insecurity. And Adam Hamilton uh, sat on this panel as one of the panelists with two other speakers, but he was also the facilitator of it. Uh, one of the other panelists was uh, Elaine Heath. She's the president of Neighborhood Seminary out in North Carolina, whose purpose is to provide theological training and education to lay people. You know, they don't intend to become or ordained ministers, but they want to they want to do ministry and have that theological uh, background uh, and foundation. The other speaker really uh, made me smile was Reverend McGray De Vega, uh, who is now the senior pastor at Tampa. Florida's Hyde Park United Methodist Church. It's a very large, urban, multi-site uh, church. Uh, Reverend De Vega is, I don't know if he is now, but he was, uh, when, when we knew him up here in Iowa, the, uh, uh, the Florida Annual Conference's theologian in residence. And like I said, he did serve up here in the Iowa Annual Conference at uh, Cherokee United Methodist Church uh, from 2007 to 2015. Well, Adam Hamilton began this webinar panel discussion with by making an observation that in Advent, you know, churches, you know, we ramp up and we worship to celebrate the birth of Christ, the first coming of Christ. But we always start by looking at the second coming of Christ. You know, e either Matthew chapter 24 or Mark 13, you know, those apocalyptic uh, kind of writings, of, uh, in, uh, which was last week's gospel. But people go back to apocalyptic crisis literature and scripture in times of crisis. Mark 13 was written at a time when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, leveled. People's lives were in chaos, and there was persecution, deprivation, destruction, and death everywhere. People were starting to question, fall away from the Christian faith. So Mark chapter 13 is a call for Jesus' followers to remain faithful in difficult times because Christ is coming back in power to restore things, to make things right. Now, if we read apocalyptic gospel passages that way, not as this kind of, you know, scary roadmap to the end of the world, but as a word of encouragement for us to stay the course in the midst of adversity, well, then we know that it's not the end times. This is the church's time. This is the disciples of Christ's time. This is your time and my time to shine light into the darkness. Because when Christians live an expectant hope and peace and joy and love, these Advent themes, <clears throat> especially in the midst of crisis, when the world isn't living those, that is exactly the time when the body of Christ, the church, and you and I as members of it, get noticed and get heard. When people who are fearful and hopeless and searching for answers are willing, even maybe desperate, to hear the gospel, to hear good news, to have good news shown to them, told to them, shared with them. Friends, that's when the world can really be changed for the better into the kingdom of God. Yeah, I remember uh, Hamilton, uh, kind of a sidebar, says, I'm always telling my people, if you want to go to end times prophecy mode in this 2020 year of COVID-19, race relations, election turmoil, natural disasters, et cetera, et cetera, you need to remember this. If you stack up all the facts, there are so many, many earlier instances in history that should have been the fulfillment of the second coming of Christ's prophecy and weren't. So as Jesus said, just always watch and be ready. Live each day in hope, in peace, in joy, and in love. Always love as though today were the day. Okay, <clears throat> I want to go back. Earlier in our worship service, Dennis lifted up such a beautiful prayer that helped us all focus and really confess the truth that this year, all of us have a lot of emotional baggage to unpack in addition to the, our nativity sets and our other Christmas decorations. And 
it was amazing because in the Advent webinar, Reverend uh, De Vega spoke to this, spoke to Dennis's prayer, asking, where is this need coming from for people who have to interpret the events of 2020, you know, through, through the COVID and the race relations, the natural disasters, election turmoil, in terms of crisis and end times? De Vega believes it's centered in people's emotional grief. People who are experiencing an acute sense of loss of meaning and purpose to all these compounding negative events of 2020 are trying to draw meaning and make sense of their grief and loss from Scripture, from God's Word. <clears throat> so he offers two words out of the Advent, first week of Advent texts that were Isaiah chapter 64 and then of course Mark 13. Those two words that he holds up for us to consider are watch and attentiveness. These words show us that, you know, we aren't as helpless uh, in all this as we think we are. Crisis, or in 2020, crises can help us see the work of God in ways that we may not have seen it before. And he lifts up a couple of examples. He says, for example, race problems have always been with us since this, before this country was founded. We just have usually chosen not to deal with it. This year, we are. Or politics. Maybe we grew up just adopting our parents or grandparents or others' political views and party affiliation without questioning until this year when the election seemed to have taken on such heightened importance. And so people let their faith or their principles or some other source inform or form their decision as we saw record numbers voting and both Republicans and Democrats crossing party lines, even changing affiliation. Dennis's prayer also opened our spirits to the possibility of change, evolving to new ministries that God may be calling us to as we emerge from this long and difficult time. That caught my ear as well as my heart because in her opening remarks, the other panelist, Elaine Heath, said this. It was right out of Genesis 1. She said, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the chaos of this year and is creating accelerated changes in the world and in the church. Get ready, folks. 2021 is going to be an exciting year of ministry when we all get to come back together again. I want you to start to visualize it, start to see it. Let's remember that Jesus often referred to blindness as a spiritual condition. So maybe Jesus is saying to us this Advent, open your eyes and in your watchfulness and alertness and awakeness, waiting for my return, see the hope, the love, and the joy. My being born into the world brings you. And then walk toward that light. Walk in that light. And for heaven's sake, walk shining that light into the darkness of this world. Listen, apocalyptic literature is all about revealing uncovering something that is true and that has been there all along but has been hidden from our view. Book of Colossians chapter 1 tells us that in Christ the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So to see what kind of God God is, we're invited to look at the Gospels. And there we find a God of compassion, of inclusion, of provision, of forgiveness, of deliverance, of mercy and love, we find a God who sees and a God who saves. We see a God who identifies with us and our human problems, a God who cares so much for us that he becomes vulnerable for us out of his great love, even dies for us, but who also always has the ultimate power in the universe over death to restore life new and better and eternal. Dr. Heath says, uh, for that reason, we should never skip looking at apocalyptic literature every Advent season because it reveals to us a God of love, care, and compassion who comes to dwell with us as Emmanuel in the worst times, in the crisis times of our lives, to shine light on the people who sat in darkness. Okay, before we end today, there are two rather heavy pieces of emotional baggage. Many of us need to prayerfully unpack this Advent season. One is fear 
of the unknown, and the other is, as we said earlier, grief of loss from our past. So just to touch on them again, how do the Advent texts address and meet these two felt needs in this COVID-19 year? Well, here's what they tell us. First, do not fear. For the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. Love that is perfect, and again, in the Greek sense of perfect, teleos, something that fulfills or accomplishes its intended and created purpose in life, casts out fear, okay? The self-giving of God to us in Jesus' birth as the Christ child, and then later his death and resurrection, is the fulfillment of the purpose of God's love to bring us all together again at, at last in relationship with our Creator and with one another. Friends, when you and I find ways to practice self-giving love this Advent season and beyond, we're going to find that our own sense of fear about the present and anxiety over the future is going to be cast out because love makes no room for fear. Secondly, they tell us God is coming to overcome our losses and the pain of those losses. Whatever we may be grieving the loss of this year, because of this year, God more than makes up for it with the birth of the Christ child. Because now, as John Wesley was inspired to say on his deathbed, no matter what, best of all, God is with us, which of course is the meaning of Emmanuel. When the Christ child grew up to become the crucified Christ on the cross, he overcame death, our greatest loss that we can experience in life. And he gave us forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. As the Apostle Paul would go on to say in his letter to the Romans, he who did not withhold his own son, but gave him to us as an atoning sacrifice, will he not with him also give us everything else? In the Gospel of Mark, Caitlin read for us that John the Baptist tells us that the biggest part of that everything else is, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Which brings us to our gospel lesson for today, and John the Baptist, who is always in the lectionary Advent readings. But truthfully, you know, uh, pastors and worship teams and churches don't really know what to do with this guy, John the Baptist. And it's because John the Baptist's figurine is not in the nativity set, okay? He seems miscast for Advent. He's more of an introduction to the Lenten journey towards Easter. I mean, if you look at just the next five verses that follow the gospel lesson that Caitlin read for this second Sunday of Advent, as given to us by the Revised Common Lectionary, you read that Jesus is baptized, has the Spirit come upon him, uh, he's driven by the Spirit up in, uh, into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days by the devil, and then he begins his earthly ministry in Galilee. Jesus kicks, or John kicks all of this off by saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Friends, that's Advent joy. It's something in which we all can participate in. It goes back to what Jesus is saying in the first Sunday of Advent's gospel reading from Mark chapter 13, the little apocalypse. Watch and be ready. Watch, notice. See what God is already actively doing now during this time of fear and uncertainty to shine the light of his love and then find a way to participate in that act. This can be a healthy antidote for feelings of fear and grief and loss and anxiousness and even hopelessness during this 2020 Advent season when so many people are acutely aware of the darkness. If that includes you this year, then I want to invite you to take this image and this thought with you as we end. 
The Carlsbad Caverns in uh, New Mexico are the world's largest underground chambers, and they boast the nation's deepest limestone cave. The National Park Service uh, conducts regular tour tours through these caves, and if you've ever gone on a, a, a group tour, you know that at the farthest point from the entrance, the tour guide gathers the group together and then turns out the light. Total darkness envelops everyone. Complete and utter darkness. During one such tour, the darkness of the darkness, uh, when the lights went out, it made one little boy start crying, the darkness did, and, and frightened by the you know, by this just enveloping uh, blackness around him, he could only c call out for help. But, and over his cries, uh, another voice uh, was heard, and it was, a, it was another uh, child's voice. It was his big sister. And she could be heard reassuringly saying to him, don't worry, somebody here knows how to turn on the light. Friends, God knows. God sent his son to be the light of the world. To overcome all the darkness of our anxiety and fear, our despair and confusion, our loneliness and our hopelessness. And that means that you and I can begin our journey into this very peculiar Advent season with hope. We can live each day anticipating an increasing experience of peace, Peace that grows into joy. Because, as the popular French carol's final refrain celebrates, love the Lord is on the way. Amen. Friends, again, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to worship with us today, uh, this week. And as you go out into this new day and this new week, may the Christ child light your path. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forever. Amen. Amen.